a kai te tohu rewa o te fare wa nanga neo te na koe na korero a te na koe te kai wahi te kau papa i te nei ahi ahi po a ka nui te mihi ki a koe a ka tiko hoki taku mihi e ki tō tātou ki ingi ki a tū heitia a te mauri o te motu me te kāhui ariki a pai mārire a kia kia tātou a tātou te iwi a kua hui hui mai nei uh, ite nei uh, ite nei ahi ahi po kanui taku mihi kanui te aroha ki o koutou i tai mai uh, ki te whakarongo ki nga kōrero e whai ake nei uh, nō reira uh, e mihi ana ki o koutou te nga koutou uh, te nga tātou katoa Well, um, thank you very much for coming along this, uh, this evening and to this lecture I suppose um, some of you might be thinking that this is just going to be a lecture about um, Māori astronomy or, or matariki maybe, but um, a professorial uh, lecture or inaugural professorial lecture is more about uh, talking, I suppose, a little bit about my journey uh, to be here tonight and to have been uh, given the title of professor here at this uh, university and some of the research that I'm involved in. So that's really what I'm going to talk about. Now, Jess outside was saying, you've got 25 to 35 minutes. That's not going to work, Jess. <laughs> Sorry, might be a bit longer. Uh, and I don't have many words. Most of what I've got to show you are images. And uh, I've entitled this uh, lecture, Te no Marama, or The Family of Light. And um, The Family of Light, is the origins of really my research and, and how I come to be standing in front of you tonight. So I suppose we should begin at the beginning and from darkness to light. So there are many tribal variations of this narrative. Uh, there are many tribal variations, many different uh, areas have their own spin on this. And I'm not about to say that what anyone else says is wrong and what I'm saying is more correct. Uh, I don't have the only version, like I say, I have the only correct version. <laughs> I have my version and this is where my research begins. So as any uh, astronomical uh, class will tell you, any astrophysicist will say that everything begins in a singularity, everything the whole entire universe was squeezed into this immensely small, tight, hot space about the size of your thumbnail, and then it exploded outwards. Māori believed that in the beginning, Rangi and Papa were stuck together in this embrace. So tight was that embrace that no light existed. And within the union, a number of children or gods were born. And it fell upon the eldest, Lord of the forest, Tāne Mahuta, to separate his parents. And he tore them apart. He ripped them apart, sending his father into the sky and leaving his mother here, uh, our mother, Papatuanuku, the earth. The problem was, as after he'd separated his parents, the world was still dark. And he had two other siblings, Tango Tango. Tango Tango is our word for darkness, for night, for blackness. And uh, I, I had an uncle, Tango Tango. Um, he was purple. <laughs> and Wainui. Wainui is uh, personified in the oceans and the uh, vast waters. And they had a number of children. The eldest was Tera, the sun. Then was Te Marama, the moon. Followed on by Na Fetu, or all of the stars. Next was Hinātore, which is a phosphorus light. Te Parikoikoi, which is a gloomy light. And the final child in the family of light, or Te Whānau Mārama, is Hinero Amoa, which is a very fine, delicate, beautiful star. And Te Whānau Mārama were housed by their father, Tangotango, in a house. And it was the first house ever constructed. Its name was Hui Te Rangiora. And as you walk into a Farenui, through that door, along that wall, up against the roof of the ceiling of the house, he hung 
the sun. Then, further along the roof of the house, at the Pautoko Manawa, where it meets the roof, he hung the moon. And he adorned the walls of the house with the stars, and he placed them in patterns. And this is the origins of the tukutuku panels that adorn our houses today. And at the back wall of the house, he placed Hinātore, Parikoikoi, and Hinero Wāmoa. And this was Te Whānau Mārama in Hui Te Rangi Ora. And Tāne, Tāne, Lord of the Forest, also the God who placed the stars in the heavens, decided he wanted to adorn his father. And so he enlisted his relation, Tamaririti, who was the owner of the first canoe. My people call this canoe Punariki. Others call it Uruau. This is a canoe upon which Tani had three baskets. Uh, the first basket held the sun, the second basket held the moon, and the final basket held all of the stars. And he put them on to the canoe, and he sped out across the ocean, and they came to a place called Te Paiwai o Te Rangi. Now this is a name that we've given to one of our scholarships here at the university, because Te Paiwai o Te Rangi is the water horizon. That is a place where the sky meets the ocean, and it's a transition point for Tamaririti and Tāne, who got to that point and then began to ascend into the heavens. And we gave that name to that scholarship for students coming to university, high achievers, as a transitioning point for them to ascend into the heavens and to achieve greatness. So they got into the heavens, and the first thing you do, I, I don't know, my tribe doesn't have an ocean, so I don't know about boats. But apparently the first thing you do is drop your anchor. And so they threw their anchor overboard, attached it to the canoe. This anchor, te puna o te waka o tamaririti, or the anchor of the canoe of tamaririti, is still visible in our sky tonight. This is Mahutonga. This is the Southern Cross. And here are the names within this group of stars. Now, this group of stars is a circumpolar a group of stars, meaning it's always in the sky in the south. It doesn't rise and set like the other stars, but goes round and around and around. And if it wasn't for Mahutonga and this anchor, all of the stars would float off and disappear. This is the point that holds all of the stars in place, ensuring that we have a night sky, the beautiful night sky we have. So Tāne. Tāne decided he was going to hang the stars in patterns. And so he began to, to, to hang and suspend the major stars and the major star groups. And he hung them in place, the big stars, Rehua, or Antares. And he hung up Takurua, or Sirius. And all the stars that you see in patterns, all of the big ones. And so happy was Tāne with what he'd done that he decided to perform a haka. And he put the basket down at his feet while he was in the sky and he did this haka and he got a little bit carried away and his arms were thrusting out and he kicked his leg out and toppled the basket over and scattered the stars across the night sky. Now I see my relation Shay Wilson uh, here tonight. This is his mountain of Ruapehu and this is Tani's basket. If you look into the Milky Way, you're looking back inside a basket, the mouth of a basket with all the stars spilling out of the basket. This is how the Milky Way came to be. This is why some of the stars are in patterns and designs in the sky, and some of them are scattered randomly across the sky. And I want you to take note of this particular star here. Can't see this image very well, there's a bit of light, but this star here is the oldest and most sacred of all of the stars. This is Atutahi. This is my favourite star. Atutahi was hung outside of the basket purposely. And I want to come back to that uh, in a few moments. So my research has mainly been dealing with Matariki and um, dealing with disseminating Matariki uh, across the country. And I've been very fortunate to have been invited to a number of places to talk about Matariki or the Pleiades. 
Now, it probably caused a little bit of controversy in some areas, particularly saying that there are nine stars in the cluster as opposed to seven. Now, if you have seven, hoia tō waka, okay? You row your canoe, okay? My ancestor left a record of nine. He left a record of nine and explains their names, explains why they're positioned where they are and what they mean. Now, by no means do I, I do not mean to offend anyone that has a different version of the story, but this is what I've been promoting as I've been going around discussing Matariki. And one of the things that I've been really trying to do is to move our perception from seeing this, these giant balls of gas burning, I know that I think that's about 460 light years away from Earth, to seeing this, understanding that for Māori, these are not giant balls of gas, they are our relations, they are our ancestors, they are deity, they are things that are connected to us throughout our lives. And this is Matariki as I understand it. There are nine stars, Matariki, the mother or the healer, and her eight children that bring a bounty to mankind every year. And this is a philosophy in the sky. You have a star that deals with our dead, Bohutukawa. The star here deals with the food we grow in the ground, the birds in the sky, fresh water, salt water, rain, winds, and our hopes and dreams for, uh, for the future. So it's about our past, our future, life and death, and everything that we need to survive is encompassed in this philosophy that is Matariki. And as part of my work, I've been trying to support a widening view of how we understand our science because Māori narrative is embedded with empirical science. We are scientists. I had not long come back from Hawaii and they call themselves Hawaiianists. We are scientists. You don't traverse that expanse of ocean without knowing your stuff. They were scientists. You don't survive and flourish in a place like this without understanding the science. But what our ancestors did was embed it into narrative. It becomes part of cultural practice and it becomes part of ceremony. And it's the ceremony that keeps the metaphysical, spiritual dimension of our knowledge alive. And this is how I view Matariki. Some of the other things that I've been challenging as part of my research is, number one, the notion of seven sisters, and Matariki being seven sisters. Yeah, that is a Greek myth. And, um, yeah, I always say, you know, me and my relation from Ruatahuna might look like we come from that movie 300 um, with big muscles, but we're not, we're not Greeks, and Seven Sisters is not a Māori narrative or an understanding of Pleiades. The Little Eyes one gets me the most. Uh, that is an Elson Best translation. He translated, that wasn't translated by a Māori, that was translated by a non-Māori, and we perpetuate these myths. We say Little Eyes, there is no narrative around Little Eyes. The idea that Matariki rises on the same day every year is incorrect because we follow a solar Gregorian Western uh, calendar and Matariki is based in a lunar calendar which is 11 days shorter so it doesn't ra rise on the same solar Gregorian calendar day every year. And the other idea that Matariki marks the winter solstice, that is not true and I've been pushing back against some of these misconceptions about Matariki and who is telling our stories. Its full name to my understanding is Nā Mata o Te Ariki Tāwhirimātea, the eyes of the god Tāwhirimātea, which the people on the east coast call Mata Ariki, which is probably a little bit more correct, and we've truncated that, shortened that to be Matariki. That's how I understand it gets its name. As part of the research, we've been trying to support people to go outside and look at our environment and to understand the movements of the celestial bodies. Just basic things like understanding the sun doesn't rise in the same place every day. 
that it rises and sets in different places depending upon the season. And when it goes northeast in winter, Matariki will rise next to the sun, telling the sun to come back to the south and bringing us warmth in the summer season. The problem with that is that wasn't our major marker in our division of time. Our ancestors followed a lunar calendar cycle. This lunar calendar cycle is something that led our day-to-day -day lives. There are good days and there are bad days. It rises and falls, rises and falls. And I know lots of people ask me, is it a good day to do this? Is it a bad day to do this? I don't know. <laughs> if you want to know, go outside and look at the moon. You know, people want you to tell them what they should be doing. The only way that you can truly live by the lunar cycle and understand this mechanism of not only timekeeping, but also of determining how well your day is going to be, your week, your month, is by going out and observing the things in our environment. And that's what we've done. We have moved away from this system and we are following a different system and someone else is telling us how to keep our time and when we should be doing something. And there are good nights and days and bad nights. Sometimes the best day to work is the weekend and the worst day to work are Monday to Friday. I've been trying to ring Brendan to tell him I'm not coming in Monday. It's kore kore. I'll see you Friday. And Brendan's like, you get in, otherwise it's kore kore for the year. <laughs> this is part of a much wider phenomenon where people are starting to return to our traditional lunar calendars and having these sit at the heart of our day-to-day -day activities. Another th issue that, that I've been working uh, on throughout my research is the timing of Matariki. And quite often we're going out to celebrate Matariki season and it's not even in the sky. It hasn't risen above the horizon, yet we're so embedded, our understanding of, of who we are is so ingrained in us is the solar calendar that we follow today. That this is, uh, this system of timekeeping doesn't work. And there are basic things like this. Matariki as a, as a star, group of stars, needs to be five degrees above the horizon while the sun is 16 degrees below. That's basic. Any closer, the light of the sun is going to wash out Matariki. And so when you understand that, then you understand when Matariki is not visible in the month of Pipiri, in the lunar phase of Tangaroa, because this is too close, you insert an additional 13th month into our yearly cycle. That period of time is called Ruhanui, or the listless period, Ruhanui. And that is the second Pipiri, or Nga Pōtū Tanganui, or Pipiri, the long extended nights of Pipiri. My work's taken me across the Pacific, and I've been lucky enough to particularly work with people in Hawaii where they have makali'i, which is matariki. Um, and actually, right throughout the Pacific, you'll see that matariki is the name that they apply to those, this cluster of stars. I've been uh, fortunate enough uh, to uh, be on a Marsden-funded project uh, this is uh, Associate Professor Hemi Fanga. We brought him to carry the bags. Um, this is on the island of Kaholawe in Hawaii. This island was bombed by the US Navy uh, for a few decades. It was actually a place where the people from Hawaii went and practiced ceremony, and it was bombed uh, and used as a target range and it was given back uh, to the people of Hawaii, and particularly the native Hawaiians, and they have been restoring the island. Part of that restoration has been maintaining the cultural integrity and their spirituality, and they go there every year to feed Matariki, to feed the stars, to feed their gods and traditional gods. So they place food and do karakia or prayers on these 
Lele or Tuahu, and this is us, a one year, uh, our Marsden project, along with our, uh, my colleagues from Te Matapunenga, uh, travelled and uh, celebrated on Kaholawe with uh, Professor Kaliko Baker uh, from Hawaii. And that's been a really, really important connection to make. I think some of the other milestones, perhaps, have been um, the release of, of um, the book here uh, that I released 18 months ago here in this room. And uh, also trying to disseminate this knowledge um, online, and I'm not too sure if many of you have uh, are following this page, uh, Living by the Stars, but it's another platform that I'm trying to disseminate traditional Māori knowledge of astronomy. The thing I'm most proud about through the research that I've been conducting for the last few years is the gathering momentum around Te Waka Orangi and the celebration that we hold every rising of Matariki to farewell our dead and to feed our stars in order for them to continually bring us bounty and ensure that our kumara grows and uh, we catch lots of titi. And this is Matariki here as part of this massive cosmic canoe. Now this canoe was captained by Taramainuku who is the owner of a cosmic net that he drops to the earth every day. And for 11 months of the year, the star is visible, this cluster is visible. He hauls to the sky the souls of all of the people who have departed that day and suspends them from the back of the canoe. And here they hang night after night after night and they disappear in the month of Haratua, which is May, June-ish, and they rise in Pipiti, June, July-ish. And when they rise, we celebrate with a hautapu ceremony where we feed the stars. And so this is our own altar, our tuahu that we have put up on Rangiatea, which is just south of Kihikihi. And we have been practicing the hautapu ceremony, farewelling our dead of the year for them to become stars against the chest of Ranginui. We feed the different stars of Matariki. So in the lunar phase of Tangaroa, we heat our umu, we prepare our food, we have a fish for, uh, uh, an ocean fish for Waitā, we have an eel for Waiti, a kumara for Tipuānuku and for Tipuārangi. I'd like to say we have a kereru, but we're environmentally responsible so we had a chicken. <laughs> now it was a titi. And there we have our um, tuahu, our, our um, rather phallic looking um, <laughs> altar. Not as big as they get in Hawaii, but it was pretty cold here. <laughs> and we prepare this uh, umu. And this is us up on top of the hill. Now, the lights you can see here are all of the cars driving to be part of the ceremony. They came and they came and they just came in their droves to be part of this growing understanding of reviving our traditional practices and our traditional spirituality. And here they are with their headlamps. The Smurfs came marching one by one coming up to the top of Rangiatea and waiting, waiting with the Tangaroa moon phase, with the rise of Matariki in the sky for us to take our reed. And then we take the food from the umu and place it on the tuahu. And here we are conducting our karakia, thanking the stars for the bounty that they have brought us, sending our wishes into the heavens along with our dead of the year that's passed. And the sun rises, 
And there are children and adults and communities coming to be involved. Many of the students from this university, here they are here, eating all of the food at the marae. <laughs> this opens the Mātahi o Te Tau, or our Māori New Year. So where to from here? I put this image up because um, I've been, this year I did 36 Matariki lectures in two months. Um, from Auckland down to Dunedin was as far south as I went. And I'm kind of sick of Matariki, I have to be honest. Uh, I love the practice, and but talking about it, and the reason is, is because that's one of a thousand Māori stars. That's one out of 103 Māori constellations, all of them having their own narrative, their own purpose, their own practice. And we're just infatuated. The only time anyone wants to be an astronomer is when it's Matariki time. Okay, we are disconnected from our sky. We are estranged from our sky and, and often from our environment. This is one constellation of 103. This is Tunanui or the great eel. All of these different points of stars are names of eels. And when they run, this cluster starts its pre-dawn rise in the month of November and ends in May. When this star is in the sky and you align it either with the full moon, the day after the full moon or the day before the full moon, that species of eel will run in the rivers. And so this is one piece of timekeeping, I suppose, one tool that our ancestors followed and was built into our cycles and our environmental cycles. This is always also the pathways, the pathway that the eels took as they descended from the heavens before the sun was placed in the sky, coming down to earth. So, tini fetu kiterangi, there are so many, many stars in the sky. From here, I'm hoping to begin a whare kōkōrangi Māori or an institute of Māori astronomy. I'm hoping to uh, gather people with expertise and students who are interested in learning about the other 999 stars and begin to practice and revive our kōkōrangi, our astronomical practices. I want to grow another generation of Māori astronomer. This practice has been missing from us and from Māori for generations. And for me, I'd like to revive this. This is not saying that they can't be astrophysicists. I really like Star Wars and the Big Bang Theory. But while uh, I really en enjoy that, there is a cultural perspective for me that is missing from our study. And I want to establish this institute and grow a new generation of Māori astronomer. I'm here because of this individual. That is my ancestor, Himiuna Te Pikikotuku, who was a tohunga, whaiwhaiā, <laughs> and a uh, tohunga kōkōrangi. The man next to him is Tū Takanahau. Uh, that is uh, a tohunga from Maunga Pōhatu. He is uh, Elston Bess, main informant for most of his writing and such an influential character and we probably don't realize just how influential he was the maori months that we follow today come from him the koko uh, uh himiona was an astronomer and he had the foresight in 1898 to begin a manuscript of 400 pages where he records the thousand names I'm talking about, 103 constellations, every one of them, he gives a narrative, what they mean, how to read them, when they rise, when they set. Most importantly for me, in the centre of that book, of that manuscript, he writes a curriculum of how to teach in a whare kōkōrangi. I'm here because of him having passed that knowledge down to his son and that manuscript who was passed down to his grandfather his grandson, and from him, who is my grandfather, to me. And that's why uh, I put him up there just to, as an example, he wasn't the only person like that. 
in the country, all tribes, had their astronomical experts. He just had the foresight to write that knowledge and hand it down. I want to come back to this star. I'm just about finished, Jess. This star here. This star is Atutahi. Like I said before, this is the great star outside of the Milky Way. All of the stars here in the Milky Way and here is Atutahi. It is the brightest star outside of the Milky Way. Not the brightest star in the sky, but is the brightest star outside of the Milky Way. And that is because the star is tapu. He is a tohunga. And as a tohunga, it is his responsibility to ensure the cultural and spiritual integrity of everything else in the Milky Way. If it wasn't for him maintaining the tapu of the night sky, the night sky would not move in unison and everything would collapse. Now his younger brother Rehua, the star Antares, approached him early in the peace and said to him, brother, return to the Milky Way, come and join us. And he said, I cannot do that. I cannot do that because if I join you, then my tapu will be negated. The night sky will lose its integrity and everything will collapse. And for me, I liken the star Atutahi to my faculty of EFMIS, the faculty of Māori and Indigenous Studies. Māori and Indigenous Studies for me and this faculty has been, of all the places I've worked, this has been for me the most important place I've come to. It's been the place where I have been able to delve into the depths of my research. I work with what I believe to be the most fantastic people uh, on the face of the earth. Uh, I admire the staff and students of my faculty. And I love the staff and students of my faculty. And as a faculty, for me, I see our role as ensuring the cultural and spiritual integrity of this institution to ensure that we function. Yes, Atutahi may sit outside the Milky Way, but it has a role and a purpose for doing so. And on to my last slide. This is my mentor, my uncle, and my landlord. <laughs> um, I was taken by my grandfather to Po as a 14-year-old to learn how to do whaikōrero. 30 years later, he's still teaching me how to do whaikōrero. <laughs> uh, when I first went to university, I uh, was taken by him uh, into his class and I instantly, in my first class, said, I want to be like my uncle. I'm still trying to get there. But for me, this is one of those moments where I want everyone to know that my journey here has only been possible because of the support systems that I've had around me. And I want to acknowledge my mentor, Po, uh, my, uh, his wife, Lena Dean. I want to acknowledge the staff uh, from our faculty. I want to acknowledge all of the staff from the university, our students, all of you for turning up. Brendan, Tenakwe, Neil, Thank you for your introduction. Uh, te nei te mihi ki a koutou katoa, ki ora te whare.